I had a, a lot of interest from a team called the Chicago White Sox because I was a pitcher. Or I was going to go into political science and go into the Foreign Service. That was what I thought I was going to do. And then some of the Mexican students, when I was studying in Mexico, social political history, these students gave me a guitar and taught me the songs of Mexico. And with that, I stumbled into a coffee house in Minneapolis, near the University of Minnesota, and uh, couldn't get a job in the summer, so walked in there to see if I could sing. And I was the only blonde, blue-eyed Norwegian that could sing a Mexican folk song, so I got the job. And from there, it just expanded. One thing led to another, and I ended up going to New York with this mask, called myself its covered man, as I said, and uh, but refused to speak. I just said, my name is David Soule. I want to be known for my music. End of story. <laughs> and and it drove people nuts. Your mum was a teacher, I think, and, you, and your father was a minister. So where did the music come from? We grew up in Berlin, and we came back from Berlin uh, in 1956. We brought back with us all of the German rounds and the cantatas and things like that. And the family, we were the kind of trap family. Uh, we were the Jacksons before the Jacksons existed. We were the, <laughs> the Osmonds before the Osmonds, <laughs> except we, it was all classical music. So music has always been part of my upbringing, but not pop music. It was all classical. They wouldn't even allow Elvis Presley in the house. <laughs> That's how rigid they were at the time. They grew up, uh, they had to, uh, otherwise disown me. But there you go. So Singing was very became a very important thing. First, as a practical matter, it got me through college, got paid my rent, and then uh, became a you know. So I realized that political science was not going to be the way out, and I'd gonna, you know music was something that really uh, caught my attention, and I focused on it, and that in turn led to uh, auditions and so forth, which took me out to California, and and that started a whole whole new era of my life from 1967 on to um, 1974, which is the beginning of uh, the Starsky and Hutch story. Yeah, well, The Covered Man was uh, on the Merv Griffin show, which we didn't get in this country. Flipper followed in 67. Other series, um, I mean, Here Comes the Brides, we didn't really get over here, but Star Trek even. I did a lot of those, uh, you know, one-off jobs. I mean, uh, and finally, uh, I was seen, and this was after I did two years of a series called Here Come the Brides, uh, I, I did a, a one-off on a show called Streets of San Francisco. Yeah, I remember that. And that was, and that's where Clint Eastwood saw me in that and said, uh, "Come on in. I would like to talk to you about this uh, film I want to do called Magnum Force, one of the Dirty Harry series." And I obviously went in and got the job. And that was seen then by Aaron Spelling, and he sent a script to my agent. I read the script and I said, "I don't want to play that." Hutch, I'm going to play the other guy. And he said, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, okay, um, I'll try to do something to make, make this guy a little more exciting than what he's written on the page. And then I, and then I, ran, and I auditioned about 100 guys to come in to play the role of Starsky. And lo and behold, in, in walks a guy that I had known in New York back in the, in the mid-60s when I first started. We would work at a restaurant called Joe Allen's. A sawdust floor, checkered tablecloth type of place where actors both worked and were served. You know, when you're out of work, you came in and worked there and you'd serve somebody who was working. And then the, and then next week it would turn around, you know, so we helped each other out that way. Paul came in and it just clicked. And they said, uh, this, this is our guy. These are our guys. So that's how it started. 